Hi. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to be giving you this test here. All right, cool. Um, so I'm going to, my name is Jonathan Burns. Uh, I work at a company called Blue Hills. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, my past job at Boston University. Um, and what we helped put in place there while I was there. Uh, and why you should do the same. And how to do it the right way. So that it works the best for you. So we're going to do a little time traveling. We're going to go back to 2016. Um, and I accepted a position at Boston University. Um, Boston University has a multi-network, multi-site instance. So it's a pretty diesel WordPress instance. Um, and so I took the position there to work on that, work on that install and, and build sites for their departments and their, their organizations in the university. Um, and so this is roughly two areas of the university that I'm going to talk about. Um, first is information services technology. And so they handle everything typical IT department would handle, um, but they also have some uh, people within there that help build WordPress plugins, um, make sure the infrastructure is up and running so that all the sites don't go down, um, things of that nature. Um, and then we're also going to talk about external affairs, which was the part of the school that I was involved with. Uh, and buried deep inside there was um, something called interactive design. And um, we work together very frequently, so that's why I want to mention both of these. Um, even though we're in separate parts of the university, we do a lot of collaboration. We work together on different sites, different uh, plugins, all types of things we work together. Um, so this is roughly our GitHub organization. And you can picture uh, external affairs as basically, um, there's also government relations in there, but mainly external affairs is uh, marketing and communications, and that's basically an agency that serves the entire university. Um, so our clients would be any school or college, uh, any individual department, any research initiative or fundraising initiative that they have. Um, we would produce the annual report every year online. Um, and we would work directly with those clients to do everything from information architecture to uh, video, photography services, um, and we also build the, the WordPress needs for each site. Um, so uh, the clients would have three options. So if you're in the university, um, your first option is to build it yourself. Um, you would use one of our pre-built themes that are available to you. Uh, you can hire someone externally, but you're going to pay a premium or you can get on a waiting list uh, for us to, to work with you. And so, this, this worked great. Um, the university subsidized that a bit. So internally, everybody can afford a good website. Um, and it was part of the initiative to have best-in-class sites uh, across the board. Um, and so within, I did with me. So, after I got settled, my supervisor went to me and he said, hey, uh, we have this site, it's getting close to being done. Uh, I want you to do a review and give me your honest opinion about you know, things, uh, issues you see within it, uh, problems that, that there might be, things you would do differently. Um, and just, just be honest and let's go over it. Uh, so I went through it and basically my findings were in three, uh, three different buckets. The first one was uh, there was some inconsistent code styles. So some people might have been using statements instead of tabs or uh, you know, putting their brackets on new lines type of thing. Uh, the next was they were uh, missing some best practices like uncached function calls or uh, missed output escaping and things like that. And then there were some performance improvements that I had, like basically um, not repeating yourself and running the same code instead of having it in multiple places. Um, and then pure performance, like making requests less often and things like that. Um, so we went over and we discussed these things and uh, you see it really well. He said, yeah, we want to get better at these things. Um, we want you to help us with this. Um, let's fix the things that we have to now and we're going to come back to this. So we fixed the output escaping, all the bad things that had to get fixed and then we, we kind of tabled it. Um, so. Fast forward about six months, I talked about how uh, if you wanted us to work with you, ID, you would go on a waiting list. And that waiting list was almost two years. So if nothing 
changed. There were no delays. There were no new projects that were uh, high, you know, high importance that got bumped to the beginning of the line because of time sensitivity. Uh, you you would wait almost two years in some instances. So this wasn't this wasn't scalable. It wasn't maintainable, especially where we were starting to do a lot more maintenance on the sites that we did launch. So um, they were working with the university and. We got approved to essentially double in two years. Uh, so it was great. We can service more clients and the wait list goes away. But we had to come back to this list because uh, these were things we saw down the road causing lots of problems if we scaled and we didn't solve them. So they would be exacerbated. Um, so we were, we were increasing awareness gradually about these things. Uh, but we realized that we, we had to solve them now because otherwise we're going to have all these this technical debt and these issues that uh, were going to cost us more time later on. So, we entered a planning phase. Uh, we wanted to make sure we outlined everything and what we needed and how we needed to work before we uh, decided what the actual implementation would be. Um, so we had some challenges. And our challenges, I think we have four of them, I think, in my list. Um, we have always have many current projects at a time. So it's not uncommon like an agency to have three or four projects that you might be juggling at once. Um, and those those uh, those projects could have multiple people on at any time. So that's that's one challenge. Developers and designers write code. Uh, so there's a, a wide spread of different types of people in the department um, that, that write code and commit to our GitHub repository. Um, the department is, uh, our designers are a little different, so the designers, they write HTML and CSS, as well as uh, the more experienced ones will write uh, WordPress templates and things like that. So uh, there's, there's many different types of people in their own code. And the department is structured in a way where people can advance throughout their career. So we have the entry level, we have uh, more senior level people, and all of them are in there in the mix. So uh, this is, again, this is our GitHub organization. And uh, let's see, this is ID only in that. These are the people that identify as designers. I twice? I got twice, I got duplicate uh, These are the people that identify as developers. And then these are the people that don't identify as either. So we had a position called a web producer, and they would work a lot on email marketing campaigns, um, basic CSS and, and HTML type stuff, but they would be in there and they would be making changes like that. Um, and there's also one other thing too, is that when I was there, uh, there were five of these people with it. So we had five, we had them, we went to four, then we had five again, uh, and then I moved on, and now there's just two other people that have, have started since. So again, there's lots of variation in the skills and experience. So you know, even with designers, there's, there's a senior, there's a junior. Uh, web producers can go to be either a developer or a designer. So there's there's, there's great variation of skill sets that uh, we have, and we didn't want something. We needed something to everybody to be able to use. We didn't want to have something that was hindering the lower, uh, less experienced people or the higher experienced. Um, some projects are very long and uh, very long running and very old. So <laughs> I was talking with some people today about this, but basically uh, this is the hardest thing I had to do when I was at the university. There were some some code bases, some repositories that were six, seven, eight years old, and there were chunks of code that were very deliberate, and you knew that they were doing things for a reason, but there was no documentation, and I knew it would break something. We didn't know where, so uh, that that was. That was one of the biggest problems that I ran into. Um, but across the board, that's, that's an issue uh, because it's, it's important to understand why decisions are made, especially when there's many people in the mix so that uh, people can pick up projects when people move on or when people start new projects and they don't have the bandwidth to continue working on a certain project. Um, so next we went to our technical factors. So these were things like uh, WordPress. We were pretty much 100% WordPress. We weren't going to change that. Um, SaaS, we were a SaaS shop, we weren't last or any of those things. Um, we uh, were uh, very heavily invested in GitHub and Slack. 
Um, so these are kind of our, our, our technical factors that they weren't going to change. We had to consider as we went through this process. Uh, and then we went through some human elements. So we wanted to uh, empower our team members, but we didn't want to um, restrict them. Who here is familiar with what a code review process is? Okay, about half. So a code review process is something where um, code, before it makes it into the wild, has to be reviewed by other people on the team. So um, we wanted something, we wanted a process in place to do this, to make our code better, to improve the quality of our, our sites. Um, but we, we also wanted to consider these human elements as well. Um, so one, it was an opportunity for people to learn. So if you, uh, motivated people love to learn. And if they don't, they get, if they're not learning, they get bored, they move on, or they, they get spiteful, they, they get bored. Um, so that was, that's, that's an important part of this. Uh, but it was also a way for people to learn from other people. So, you know, a senior dev has some code that they wrote, and they need someone to review it. A more junior dev can review it, and they can learn something. And vice versa, the, the junior devs can, show some skills that they know that see you guys don't know and they can pick up from that. Uh, so, opportunity for knowledge sharing. Everybody is very good at what they do. And so, we wanted an easier way for people to share that knowledge. Um, in face-to-face -face knowledge sharing is a very time-consuming thing. It's very difficult to, to get the, both the resources and the time and that time slots that match up to be able to do that. Um, so this is more like one of the goals of this was to have a more asynchronous way to do this. Um, collaboration. We, like I said before, we do a lot of work with ISMT, and we wanted this to be another way to collaborate. Um, we did face-to-face -face knowledge sharing with them uh, every other week. We would have a face-to-face -face meeting with them for an hour. Someone would present about something they were working on or something they were learning. Uh, but again, even then, there were some people that couldn't make it week to week uh, for whatever reason, they had other meetings. So this was another way to, again, asynchronously be able to do that. Um, improved onboarding. If you have a, re a set of rules of how you do things and a process in place, then it's much easier to uh, onboard people. You can pretty much point them in the direction of the rules and help them out if they have questions, but you can, uh, more sooner, you can throw them into the fire and have them, you know, get in, get their hands dirty, and work on some, some projects. Um, this is also a great way for um, higher level people to learn where people's weak points are. Um, so, you know, managers can look at the code reviews and see where people need to work, what skills they need to work on, uh, who might be good fits for certain projects because of certain strong points. Um, and then they'll also see, uh, they'll learn from coding standards and best practices that are enforced in, in the, the, the uh, workload. Alright, so step one, we had to establish our rules. Um, and this is going to help us identify the tools we needed. So the first rule is everyone must use the same code style. Um, so when you change to a new project, it shouldn't be a jarring experience. You shouldn't have to waste time trying to figure out how the code's aligned or be able to read it. Um, it would be like if you go from an, one book you're reading to another book and the font's all different and it's all crooked on the page. And so you, you kind of have to figure out, you take some time to figure out how to actually read the code and how it works. Um, if everybody's using the same style, then I can hop from repository to repository and there's no cognitive um, time that it takes to kind of jump right in other than reading the code and figuring out what's actually going you're right down to business. Um, everyone must follow best practices. So this in rule one is the uh, equals coding standards. Um, I've talked here before about coding standards, and so I look up those talks and go in more detail. Um, but basically, these are these are rules that will help with consistency and preventing common mistakes. So these are often they'll learn through lessons, so people break things, they figure out why, and they say this is why, but it's better if you do this all the time, it'll help you prevent that. So again, these are, this is uh, one of the main points we, we wanted to have. Everyone must follow the same workflow. Um, so I'm not talking about 
everyone has to sit at their computer and open Photoshop and do a mock-up and then put it in work. And that's what I'm talking about. Um, I'm talking about how we use GIMP, or our GIMP workflow, and I'll talk about this in detail in a bit. Everything must be properly documented. Um, Inline documentation was required, so if you introduce new functions or change things in the function, you had to update inline documentation. And uh, you know, we're always asked, does this need new user documentation? Does this need uh, staff documentation for other people that aren't in the code? Um, and a lot of times, at the end of the project, it needs to be documented anyway, and nobody likes to do that. Go back at the end and have to go through and write documentation. So it's much easier and less time consuming to do it as you go. Everything must be accompanied by tests. Um, so this mainly applied to our plugin repositories, not so much our themes. Um, we have a theme framework and that had some tests, uh, some unit tests, but this is mainly for our plugins. And the second set we wanted to create our process. So we took all those, those uh, rules that we set and we said, okay, how are we going to enforce this? How are we going to make this easy to do? And how are we going to make this constructive process? So our first question was, what are, what are our coding standards? So this one was easy for us because uh, WordPress has coding standards already. Um, these are maintained. They're community accepted as best practices. Um, they cover multiple languages, HTML, PHP. They even have inline documentation uh, coding standards. And the other benefit of this is that if we're using WordPress standards, uh, our software is going to work good with WordPress, but then our employees are also going to be able to dive into WordPress to figure out how things work, and they'll be more comfortable there. So that first thing of everybody using the same code style kind of removes that uh, intimidating factor of, oh, how am I going to jump into WordPress and see how it works? It's, it's they're going to be familiar with it. Um, so there were some differences that we didn't, some rules we didn't want to follow there. Um, and for those, we had a repository, a coding standards repository, where we would document these. Um, so for example, um, all of our plugins, you had to use PHP namespaces, but that's not in the WordPress documentation because um, WordPress supports a version of PHP that doesn't support that feature. Uh, but we knew in our environment, we were always going to have that feature, so we always wanted to, to have that. Um, continuous integration. Uh, so this is basically when you make a change in your code base, there will be uh, a set of tools or a set of uh, tests that will run every time. And uh, it's, it's aimed around rapid changing. So many people making commits, there's always these things running in the background. Uh, we had this for some unit tests, uh, but we, we were pretty sold on Travis CI because uh, it's just what we had been using. We didn't have a, a big reason to move to a new one. So we thought, okay, now how, we know what our code styles are, we know what our continuous integration tool is, how do we enforce these? Um, we looked at a bunch of tools, we found that PHP CS, which is the code sniffer, is uh, a way to automatically run uh, a bunch of checks, they call them snips, uh, in, in the command line. Uh, but again, this, this was not very friendly for uh, the designers. Uh, and even the, the web pages. even the developers, this was difficult to get set up. Um, and running this in the command line required everybody to get it installed on the machine, configured correctly. Everybody has different machines and different versions uh, of, of OS. Um, so this was not really feasible for us to, to have working. Um, you, you can also run this through Travis. So we looked at that. Um, there's a couple of uh, pluses and minuses of that. One of them is that if this, there are errors that are introduced, the build will fail, and then we didn't want that. We wanted it to be a little more visual, a little more um, easier to digest and less intimidating. Um, there's also a companion tool for this called PHP CBF, which is a code beautifier. Uh, and so all, the, all of the lines with an X, you can actually fix those automatically my computer would say that. Um, you can fix those automatically uh, by running the PHP CDF command, but we also didn't want that because uh, we, we saw there was value in people 
reading what, what the violations they had in their code and going back and actually fixing them. It was, it was a learning experience. So we wanted to encourage that and we didn't want them to be, uh, to be just fixing them with, with the automated tools all the time. Um, so we looked around, we settled on Code Climate. Code Climate is a great tool. Uh, it's doing everything that you just saw, but in a more visual way. Um, so the goal with this tool was to uh, take the mundane things that we should be doing, like spacing correctly and aligning correctly and having certain um, a pattern to different variables and things like that. And uh, we wanted a machine to basically find these things so that our reviewers wouldn't have to focus on those. Um, so we have all of our files in this repository. It would give you a grade. Um, you could type in your uh, test coverage to see what your test, uh, how, how the percentage of tests uh, your, your repository is being tested. Um, and this allowed us to, uh, not in addition to PHP, we were able to uh, analyze our CSS, our SAS, and our JavaScript in this as well. Uh, we even added markdown linting, which is for your readme files. Um, and we had rules for how you would structure your readme files as well. Um, so if you dive into that, it would show you uh, every issue. You could, um, you could create issues in GitHub right from here. You can filter them based on uh, their, their severity or, the, or what category, what type they are. Um, and a lot of times there would be links to click and learn more there. So uh, this removed that burden um, and that intimidation factor for people who weren't as technical and weren't comfortable in the command line. Uh, and they could, they could see this and, and solve these issues a lot easier. Uh, the other thing we liked was that it has its own line uh, on, the, on the pull request. So it's very easy to see, okay, our test passed, but we have coding standards issues. Okay, let's go see what it, oh, I missed the space, I missed an alignment. Uh, okay, now those are fixed, now someone can come and remake code. Uh, and on every pull request, it would tell you how many issues you fixed and how many uh, you introduced. So in this example, we have one that's introduced, and then there was a list at the bottom that were, that were fixed. Um, so it shows you, okay, you factored this code. We have one, but we got rid of 10 issues here. So let's fix that one, and we're, we're making our code better. Uh, and again, after it merges, we have a history of, uh, of, of what the state of that pull request was when it was merged into our code base. The other uh, example is, like I said, it's not, we, we chose to um, block merging if you uh, had failing tests, but we could still allow it to be merged if code climate didn't pass completely. Um, so this was great because there were some times where we didn't want to follow a certain standard in that situation. Um, there are ways to whitelist the, the instance, but we didn't want to always do that. So this was a great way to kind of allow that to go through. Um, we also configured a threshold, so 80% of your new code or more in that pull request had to be tested. And again, this is just to take that minutia out of code review. We wanted to find uh, all these coding standard things that were detectable automatically, and we wanted our, our uh, code reviewers to be able to focus on the content of the, of the code, and what it was doing and how. Um, and the main benefit on this service was that we, in our coding standards repo, we had all of our rule sets for how the, the linters and the engines would run. And so when CodeClimate would, when we'd set it up, we'd add a configuration file, and that configuration file would know where all of these files are. So down the road, if the coding standards changed in WordPress and we didn't want to follow a rule, we could update it in one place, and then every single repo that used uh, these files externally would get the same uh, configuration file. And this also allowed us to have multiple versions. Uh, so we had some older projects where we had different linting rules than our newer ones and, and so on. So that was, that was actually really useful. Um, and our next step is documentation. So um, we decided to, uh, in every repo we had a contributing file which explained how you would contribute to the repo, but it would link out to a contributing file in our coding standards repo. So again, we had uh, the documentation in one repo, we updated it in one place, we didn't have to update every repo and there was a change to how you uh, contribute code, it would just link out. Um, every pull request, we wanted every pull request to have documentation. Um, so 
This included, uh, we, we encourage, especially in our plugins, um, every pull request should add to the change log. And then when the release date comes, we need to release a new version. We have a list already of everything that's there. We don't have to spend three hours going through every pull request and seeing what changes uh, and describing it in this, in this change log. Uh, and here, this is the release process in GitHub, so we would just basically be able to copy it and say, in this release, and say, for more, read the change log, and so on. Um, and then the last step was training. So we held a lot of face-to-face -face training sessions. Um, we made ourselves available. We made sure that the process was documented, and um, anyone that needed help, we were able to walk them through it initially. Uh, this went really well. It wasn't... It was the first time we did it, we realized we had to add some stuff in this and tweak a little, a few things, but it actually went better than we expected. It was, it was uh, across the board, more people were able to, to, to grok it and understand it than we thought. So we entered a beta testing phase. Um, we, we basically brought ICT in, we explained the process to them, and we said, hey, try it out with us, and let's see how it goes. Um, we had a few projects that we tried out on, so we had uh, a handful of designers and a handful of web uh, producers and of course all the developers were on. So we were seeing how it went, where were the pain points, what do we need to improve? And we came up with uh, some additional rules. So these are kind of lessons we learned. Limit your pull request scope. Um, you shouldn't create this 10,000 line pull request and then ask someone to review it. Nobody's going to do that. Nobody has time to do that. That's not being a good team member. We wanted, we wanted um, every pull request to get attention that it deserved, but we also didn't want to discourage people from, from looking at the code. Um, so every, every time you make um, pull requests, it should be addressing one thing, describe it, and then if you have something else, make another branch and make another pull request. Avoid looks good to me. Um, so this is basically, this is usually a sign that someone's not really reviewing it or they don't have anything to say about it. So a good, a good way to test if you uh, are in a bad looks good to me culture is you can put a bug in your code that's very easily catchable if they actually read the code. Mm -hmm. And if they approve it and says look good to me, then we need to, we need to talk to everybody about uh, what, what we should be doing during code plus. Uh, make suggestions. So in GitHub now, you can um, make suggestions. But we don't want you to jump in and make changes on the branch. Um, it's, it's, the responsibility is on the person that opened the pull request to make those changes. Um, we don't know the full background of it, we're just reviewing the code. Uh, but we should understand what it's trying to do and what it's trying to accomplish. But they ultimately have the final decision of, uh, well, okay, let's do that, that's a good suggestion. Uh, there's something I didn't mention here that prevents us from doing that and so on. Uh, deleting branches after they're merged. So when the pull request is merged, it should get deleted, and anything further should be in a new branch. Um, sometimes people merge their code, but then they don't delete the branch, and then it's not really clear what's ongoing work and what's finished. You might end up with like 10, 20, 100 branches that are just sitting there, haven't been touched, um, and it's hard to tell if they actually, the work in was actually finished or not, or abandoned. Um, so, again, when you merge your PR, there's always that point in, uh, in history that we can always find in GitHub, so we wanted to always do that. Um, good branch naming. Always be descriptive. Um, one that I like to do is use the GitHub issue and then a description. Um, we also would do, sometimes we would do like fix and broken admin links for members. Um, and whenever we did a release of a plugin, we would always prefix it with release. Uh, and I talked about this a little bit. Um, the, the pull request, the person that creates the pull request, um, it's their responsibility to keep up with the PR, um, make sure that it, the, the merge conflicts, it's up to date and master, uh, it can be merged. And it's after it gets approved, it's their responsibility to merge it and close it and test it before they do that and make sure that, okay, it does still do what it's supposed to do and we're good to go. So sometimes there are stalemates where the person reviewing the code thinks that it should be one way, the person that wrote it thinks it's another way, and uh, they can't really come to an agreement. 
Um, so for these instances, we would um, we bring in a third party to review it. Um, everybody that has an opinion should have it documented on the pull request. Um, and then, basically, the change is not about getting your way. Um, it's basically about doing what's best for that code base, for that, that project. So all opinions, again, should be documented. Um, third parties called in make the final decision. And they, could, they should consider what's the most future-proof uh, solution. And does one approach uh, prevent pivoting to another approach down the road? So there should always be a way to change it. And if that's difficult, then maybe that should, the code should be changed to allow that later. Like if this doesn't work, uh, we can go back and switch it out with something else later. Um, ah, code review etiquette. Um, I missed this slide. But I didn't Sorry, I missed one that was kind of important. Okay, back to the I guess not. I don't know where it is. Um, okay. Ah, here it is. So what is the correct way to Git for us? So we decided, um, this is a more traditional Git flow. So you have, um, master is always the um, production ready code. Uh, you have hotfixes, which go into master. Develop is where all ongoing work is. And there are features. And then releases get pulled into master. And it works really great. Um, but it didn't work for us because um, GitHub doesn't really support this. GitHub is very flat. So when you look at GitHub, they use something called GitHub flow. And it's basically you have one branch, and everything comes out and goes back into that branch. Um, when you think of pull requests, there's <coughs> There's no way to, dis to make a branch more special than another branch. There's really no way in GitHub to have a release branch or a feature branch. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a more flat structure. Um, so we went with a little bit of a hybrid. Um, there was no committing directly to the master branch. Master was always our production ready code. Um, or our primary branches were always our, our production ready code. In plugins, that meant it was developed. And um, themes was master. But master was always the production ready code. So we had a primary branch and then master. Master was always the, the production ready code. Um, anytime you, so in a plugin, you have all this stuff in develop that's ready to get released. There should always be a pull request into master so that it can be version. Okay. Uh, and when, in, uh, again, yep. Yeah. Uh, and in that pull request, we should implement the version, um, and that would help with cache testing if there's changes to our JavaScript or CSS, and also just to our change log to, to see what changed in what version. Okay. All right. So, additional factors for success. Um, everyone must buy in. Uh, so if some people are doing it and others aren't, then it's not, it's not going to work. Um, also, code review takes time, uh, so this has to be considered as a part of your process now. So, this is now a part of the process. Um, this goes into getting management to back it, uh, having your, your project managers understand, okay, maybe three hours a week, uh, everybody is spending review, uh, reviewing other people's code. Clearly set the expectations. Um, so, this process throws a lot of information at people, and we found that people had a tough time uh, understanding it. Uh, so the one thing that we found was the toughest for some people to understand was, uh, was this page here. And it's very useful, and they, they were able to use it to fix their issues. Uh, but the big thing that they had a hard time with was, right, everybody wanted to have an A, and they would waste time trying to get an A, and we had to step back and say, okay, this is, this is not meant to have an A. We're not meant to be perfect. Um, this is just a guide to help us write better code and be better at what we do and, and find mistakes. But we don't want to have an A all the time. That's not, that's not feasible. Uh, everybody reviews code. 
So this doesn't matter if you're a manager uh, or you're an entry level person. Everybody needs to put in their fair share of time reviewing the code. And we all, again, like I mentioned earlier, we all learn from different skill levels and skill sets. We all were very intelligent at what we did, and everybody had specialties. Um, so it was important for everybody to, to review, uh, and also necessary because if there's only three people reviewing, uh, none of these codes are going to get reviewed. And things are going to get stale, and things are not going to get uh, merged in and pushed out, and that's going to slow us down. Uh, so this allowed us to, once we had the process in place, uh, it allowed us to explore some additional processes. Uh, so one of them was um, we put in, in place uh, pull request templates. So GitHub allows you to have a file in your repository that when someone clicks a uh, new issue or a new, new pull request, it would automatically populate the, um, the body of that, of that new item. Um, you can also get into uh, detail where if someone creates a new bug, it will give them something else other than a, a general issue. Um, so that was helpful to make sure that everybody was um, providing enough detail in their pull requests. Um, so this is um, uh, Gutenberg. This is an example of a template. So when you click on, I believe this is the uh, issue template. Uh, this is the bug issue template. So if you created a new bug, these are the things that you would be prompted with to fill in in your, in your pull requests. Uh, we explored some automated documentation. Uh, so this, this here, this whole site was generated automatically using the inline documentation in the repositories. Um, so every time uh, master was tagged with a new version, it would automatically run this and update. Um, and it would, you know, document all the parameters, all your argument, your uh, your functions, and and so on. And, and it was just a nice win. This, this, after it was set up, it didn't require any work. It would just run, and it would just push automatically to get up pages for that, um, for that repository. So it was a nice, easy win to have. And uh, some people used it, some people didn't, but I, I found this helpful for me. Um, we, we messed around with automated accessibility testing. Um, this is a tool called Pali, P A 11 I. And um, it runs in the command line and identifies potential accessibility issues. Um, we, we tried to run this in Travis. We were working on uh, some way to get that going. Uh, we didn't quite get there. We also messed around with their dashboard, which you, allows you to put different URLs, and it will scan for accessibility issues, um, and it aggregates it into a, uh, some graphs in here as well, and it, and it identifies all your issues. Um, we didn't get this in place, though, fully. Uh, we played around with automatic deployment to a staging environment. Um, we, our problem with this was we had many different staging environments and many different uh, versions of the site at any given time. So we had, we had a little bit of trouble with that. Um, we looked at a tool called Alex. Um, Alex was a JavaScript tool that would catch uh, inconsiderate writing. So uh, we have this here. You can run it in the command line. And it will find uh, you know, profanities and things that you're not supposed to be saying or might hurt people's feelings. Um, we wanted to, to try to use this on our commit messages, so we encourage people to write more thoughtfully uh, and write better commit messages. Um, but there's also um, tools for all the popular code editors that you can have. Uh, we looked at visual regression testing, which Basically, it would spin up uh, a test site with the old code and then with the new code and it would compare the two. And uh, it would help us find things that we weren't intending to happen. Uh, so you can see here, the pink is, is things that have changed. Um, so we, we, again, we didn't actually implement that, but that's something that uh, we're still very interested in. Uh, ultimately, this is a learning a learning process. Um, we, we wanted it to, again, help our productivity, get better at writing our, our code, um, but it's, it's about learning. And um, the culture was very anti-working off hours there, um, but we wanted to still empower the team, mem to, uh, team members to learn what they wanted to. Um, so we looked into some tools. Uh, Treehouse is what we went with. We bought a team license. and. Um, we found some good results from this. Uh, 
a lot of people were finding new things during the day and they would go home and they would work on it and you know, watch TV and they plug away at the exercises. Um, so that was very, uh, a very win-win. It was, again, it was another thing we just had. It was available to people if they wanted it, um, they could use it. And I think I this one uh, column there. So some etiquette here. Um, you want to review the person, not the code. Uh, the code, not the person. Sorry. Um, remember that somebody worked hard on the code that you're going to look at. And so you don't want to be like, this is garbage, or what are you doing? It's going to hurt feelings. We want to be uh, constructive in this process. Um, and when, when looking and discussing logical things like code, it's very easy to disregard that it's, it's actually a human thing, it's not uh, you know, a finite thing. Um, so, bad example. This is terrible, why did we hire you? Not a good review. So you need to be detailed, more detailed. We're a little better, we're getting there. A little less aggressive, but we're still referencing the person. There are some small details missing here we should account for. We need to make sure our X's are Y and Z, and prevent, this prevents ABC, and so on. So this is, again, we're, we're removing the person from the code review, and we're making it more us instead of them, uh, and then less attacking. Um, but we're also clearly explaining what is missing, or what's wrong. And why? Yeah. Why? Well, if someone is just like really awful and you're really like, spending a lot of money on the video. So, <laughs> let's come back to that at the end. Um, again, avoid you. You should do that. We should do that. This is a little bit better. So, you should use out for escape your name. We should use out for escape your name. So, again, it's a little less attacking. It's just you remove the person, it's a, it's a little more passive, and it's, it's a much better way to receive feedback. Um, when you have something critical to, uh, or some critical feedback to give, uh, the person is more likely to receive it in a positive manner if they're engaged. Um, so a good way to do this is to ask a question. Uh, so if we go back to our other example, uh, the, second, the second item says, if we pass a boolean value to this function, it looks like it will be converted to a string. Is this intended behavior? If so, can we document it? So we're asking questions, we're, we're prompting them for a response, and you know maybe that's how it's supposed to be, but you know they didn't document it enough there. So and then last of all, uh, this is again everyone makes mistakes and Everyone that is in that process is gonna, someone's gonna find something that you missed or you didn't, you didn't do correctly. Um, but the big key in this is just attitude and making sure everybody's on board. Um, and you know, if, if someone's having a really hard time with this, uh, a hard time with giving feedback or receiving feedback, um, you know, maybe they're just not the best fit for the team uh, or maybe they just have certain frustrations that they need to talk to you about and, and things you need to work on. Um, but again, attitude is just the, the number one thing here. Um, so, let's see. So yeah, so how, the question was, uh, what if someone really is bad and you do think about why did you hire them? Um, so, I think with this process, we had enough uh, avenues for people to self-improve. Um, there were plenty of ways to ask questions. There were plenty of ways to learn on their own or learn from other people um, and we, we weren't like typical cubes but there were um, there's many people in the, in the office so they were always able to go talk to other people um, so if they were trying and you know that's that's a little bit different for us uh, but if they uh, you know they just they're just not working out they're not getting it we would see is there a better place a better fit for them and you know internally like what can we have them work on that's more suited to their skill set um, I mean, if it's not there, if the effort's not there, and they just don't want to get better, then again, maybe it's just that they're not a good fit for the team, and they're not, um, you know, they, they, it was a mistake to, to bring them in, you know, they weren't what you thought they were. Yeah. Yeah.
get the, the, the little things out of the way so that in the pull request, that's what they can focus on. Um, so the goal was how can we get people able to focus on what the bird is doing and how? Is it efficient? Is it scalable? Is it um, future proof? Can we make this more flexible? Uh, those are the things that, the, that our team members can focus on in their programs because we have all these uh, minutia out of the way. in case there weren't any, and I think it's a good one. Um, so what do you do if you're a small organization and you don't have people to review your own code? Maybe you're the only developer in the organization. Um, I still think it's important to do something like this, get a process like this in place. Um, and at the minimum, when you start to add new developers and people that work in your repositories, you're gonna have at least have that history in, in there of the, the progression of the features, when they were changed, how they were changed, and why. Um, so again, it's like it, it lessens that learning curve and it helps you scale later on as a business as well. Yeah. I have another question. So, as we said, we have to do things the right way. Yes. So the question is, how do you get them in to buy in? Because this is a time, this can be time consuming, and uh, it, how do you make business sense of it? Basically, that was another question I had in case nobody asked questions. So that was a good. One. Um, it, it's basically you're you're not only are you strengthening your team members and uh, helping them learn from other people, and so long term it's beneficial for the organization. Everybody improves. Um, but it's also you're, you're releasing the burden down the road of technical debt and things that are going to have to get updated later, uh, things that won't work in future versions of WordPress. If you're following the code standards and best practices, um, you're going to have future proof code. Uh, there's a lot of plugins in the repository that um, six, seven years they haven't been touched, but they still work because they follow the best practices and code standards. Uh, and so, you know, they might, they're going to start working eventually, but for the most part, they will continue to work. Uh, so these are things that you can sell management on. It's basically uh, onboarding. Onboarding is very expensive to hire new people. If you have this process in place, like I said, you have your, your guidelines, you have your documentation process, why you do certain things for what you do. Um, you can throw them, you can throw them into the process a little sooner. Um, and then you kind of take some of the burden off of your people that have been there longer to teach the newer people how to do things. So it's, it's kind of just spread out, the benefits are very spread out, um, but over time we'll, we'll benefit from that and do uh, onboarding and, and scaling the work we'll benefit from that. Well,
Uh, so the question is how do you find and 